took a look at it. I mean, it's not like back home where I grew up in upstate New York with all the oak tree leaves where they were nice and red. These were just nice and yellow. And then one guy came around and said, you need to look over there. And in the river and one of the logs sticking up, there was a bald eagle. And saw him take off and kind of go down, and that was kind of neat. But why do I bring this up? Well, if we look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, it says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they were out without excuse. So God is in those things that we see. And I kind of thought back to a time when we were living in Oregon, and I started taking our oldest daughter out for hikes. She wanted to go out on hikes. And I got this book, and we go out on some hikes, and we go back to these waterfalls. You know, they were pretty easy because she was still kind of young. And I often think, do we tell our children about these things when we're out in nature with them? When you take your sons or daughters hunting, when you take them fishing or when you go out camping, do you take the time to look at the wonder of God and explain the wonder of God through nature? And you might want to ask yourself, well, why do we want to do this thing? And if you go back to the Old Testament in uh, Deuteronomy, um, Chapter 18, and verse, sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 11, and then verses 18 through, uh, through 20. God is talking about what they need to do. It says, you shall therefore impress these words of mine on your heart and on your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall teach them to your sons, talking to them when you sit in your house, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Do we do that as parents? I mean, do we do that as grandparents for some of us? When you have your grandkids and you're on an outing, do you take the time to show them how God can be seen in nature? How we're thankful for the things that God provides when you have a successful hunt or a successful fishing trip or even a successful camping trip. There's lots of things to be thankful for. And do we express that thanks so that our kids can understand what God has given us on this earth? A lot of, a lot of things we hear these days is all negative about the earth and what's happening to it. But if you really take the time just to sit and look and watch the change of seasons, see what's happening with the animals, see what's happening with the plants, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. And God's plan is doing that for us. I mean, how, do we, how can we understand how a tree has the leaves and we know exactly what time for the leaves to change color and in the fall? Or the flowers to blossom and to have seeds so that they can propagate for next year. So as you think about these things tonight, think about the time that you can have spent with your kids, your grandkids, your friends, your relatives, and teaching them about the wonders of God. I mean, we're in Montana. You recreate outside. That's what we do. So if there's somebody that needs prayers or help, from the church, we ask that you come forward as we sing a song of invitation. I still have joy, I still have joy after all the things we've been through. I still have joy. I still have joy, I still have joy After all the things we've been through I still have joy, I still have peace I still have peace After all the things we've been through I still have peace, I still have faith 
I still have faith after all the things we've been through. I still have faith. I still have hope. I still have hope after all the things we've been through. I still have hope. I still have job. I still have love after all the things we've been through. I still have love. I still have joy. I still have joy after all the things we've been through. I still have joy after all the things we've been through. After all the things we've been through. After all the things we've been through. I still have joy. Please be seated. Hey, good evening. Great to have each and every one of you here this evening. Thanks for being here for Bible class. And I uh, just want to welcome back uh, Matt and Hannah and Manna and Asher. Great to have them back with us and really uh, excited about uh, their time away, but also about their homecoming as well. So we do want to uh, continue to keep the, the Groves family in your prayers. Uh, Peter's father, Wesley, uh, died on Sunday. And that funeral is on this Saturday coming up in Missouri. And uh, we, I did talk to Peter today. He seemed to be in, in pretty good spirits. So, But keep them in your prayers. And uh, we did have a request, a prayer request online, which is kind of exciting in a way. Uh, it came in on Monday. And uh, yeah, I guess they know that we're people of prayer, right? So that's pretty exciting. It's for Denise Crow. Uh, Denise has a bone disease called avascular necrosis. She's in pain nearly every day, so let's be praying for Denise. And uh, perhaps uh, CJ could do that tonight as well when he comes up to lead our closing prayer. Also, our life groups are this Sunday. We're excited about that. There are uh, leaders uh, discussion guides in Matt Burleson's box, and our next uh, Teen Devo will be this Saturday, the I'm sorry, Saturday the 9th at Matt and Hannah Burleson's home. That's at 5.30. Boys will bring chips and girls will bring drinks or desserts. The fall seminar will be with Luke Dockery as October 9th and 10th here at the building. Uh, Luke will be discussing youth in family ministries. Please mark your calendar to join us for that. And we'll have a teacher's meeting on o October 13th to go over how classes are going we're asking for all the teachers to attend so we can get everyone's input. A couple more things. Uh, one is the Power for Todays are available, that devotional on the back counter, so make sure and pick one of those up. Uh, the new ones start in two days, so uh, it's a great, great way just to uh, get into God's Word and uh, do some thinking and reflecting on what that has to say and how it relates to our life. And tonight we do need some help uh, carrying over clothing and hangers back from the fellowship hall back to the office from our closing giveaway. So if you can help with that, that would be greatly appreciated right after class, especially maybe our, our teenagers and our young uh, adults could come in to fellowship hall and help with that. That would be a great blessing for the uh, clothing giveaway team. So we'll go ahead and stand together and we'll release our teachers at this time and we'll have our closing prayer. Would you bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we're truly grateful for this opportunity that we have to come together to study your word, dear Lord. And there's many that we'd like to lift up before you tonight, uh, many that are sick, uh, various ailments, uh, whether physical or spiritual, dear Lord. We ask that uh, you would be with them. We pray for Denise, who's suffering from that uh, bone disease. We ask that you would be with her and, and ease her pain, dear Lord, and, and help her to find comfort in you and in your word. We also pray for our brother um, and sister of the Groves family. We ask that you would be with them as they go through this difficult time of loss of a loved one. And we pray that you would be with them and be with their family as they go through this grieving process, dear Lord. And, uh, we thank you for all the many blessings you've given us. We thank you for the hope that we have in Christ, and we ask that you would help us to never take that for granted. And it's in his precious name we pray. Amen.
Well, good evening, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and start getting started. So if you want to be making your way to your seat, getting out your Bibles and going to Philippians 1, that's where we will be in just a moment. Philippians chapter 1. Okay. Hey, Josh, can you try to advance my slide, please? Maybe... Once you do it, there we go. There we go. Okay, I think we're good now. Perfect. Well, I want to pray in just a moment, but I want to start out by just saying a thank you to Scott Lucason, who has left the room. But thank you. There you are. (laughs) Thanks to Scott Lucason for teaching the last two weeks. Surely it's so good to see you. Been praying for you from a distance. And saw Brian and Brenda Blair here. Uh, They're just answered prayers sitting all around us. I'm so grateful for that. So as I said, we'll pray in just a minute, but before we get started, are there other prayer requests you'd like to make known just for our class? Sir. Okay. Clinton Porter. I'm sorry. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, others? Ross? Uh, brother that used to live here and, and worship with us, Craig Barnes. Okay. He's, uh, he's down in Texas now preaching the Book of Life on Sunday Street and Tuesday. Okay. You got it. Okay. Hi, Kyan. You got it. Okay. Okay. Are there others? Okay. Once we get started, I want to say a few things, and as I said, we'll pray in just a moment. Uh, If you don't already have a copy of the book, just as a reminder, we're using a book for this class, which is a survey of Restoration Movement history. And the the book we're using primarily is Gary Holloway and Douglas Foster's book, Renewing God's People, A Concise History of Churches of Christ. And so uh, if you haven't gotten this one, and I've seen that several of you have, you can still get this on Amazon, and, and we'll still have enough time in it that it'll be worth your while to do so. So I encourage you to do that. And thanks to those of you who have already done that. One other housekeeping matter as we get started. This is just a a request I've been hearing for the last few weeks from those online. Is that when you speak to make a comment uh, or respond to a question, I'd encourage you just to speak up. It's a little bit harder. It might help if I turn the microphone on. (laughs) It's a little bit harder for those online to hear. And so when you speak, I will do my very, very best to rephrase, not rephrase, to to repeat the question or the comment that you've made. And if I forget to do that, you might just say, hey, you need to repeat that for those who are online. So we do have some who tune in and and would like to be able to, to hear our comments. And so as we move forward, I've already said thank you to Scott Lucason uh, for covering chapters 2 and 3 in the last two weeks. And as we get started tonight, I want to begin with this question, for what are you most grateful up to this point? You might think of this as a highlight question. What has stood out to you that you're most grateful for in the first three weeks of our class? And I'll just open it up to you. Go ahead, Ross. Ross. Faith in God has never really died. That's, that's wonderful. It's encouraging. Thanks, Ross. Trevor. I'm just, I'm just grateful that we have history that we can look back on. Yes. Where we came from and what was the second part? And just why, why it is that we came. Yeah, and so Trevor's <laughs> saying he's grateful for history that we can look back on, see where we came from and, and why we came about. Joe. Yes, so those who question 
the way things are? Why has it always been like that? Yes, those people are often the, uh, the spark that ignites the movement. It's interesting. It's a consistent theme. Anything else you want to just say, I'm grateful for this, just this far into our study? They preserved the word of Christ. Yes, that's been a very common thing. Marcy. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So the church had been in quite a wilderness uh, through the, the centuries, and the restoration is an attempt to come out of the wilderness. That's good. There's a lot we can be grateful for, and we'll just we'll keep moving from this point. Uh, but I just want to point out that let's keep a gratitude focus as we go through. You know, there are a lot of things as we go through this that we could pick apart and we could say, you know, I wish they hadn't done that, or I wish they would do this instead, or I think they could have done this better. But let's just try to be grateful for what they did and, and recognize that uh, the things that maybe they didn't get done, that's where we come in. And, and we can continue the restoration process. Tonight what I want to do is I'm going to give a quick, fairly quick overview of the chapter. Then I want to do two deep dives as much as we can do in the next little while uh, on, on two particular pieces of the restoration. With Thomas Campbell I want to zoom in and focus on the declaration and address. If you've been reading you'll, you'll know what that is. If you haven't it may be new to you but we'll focus on the declaration and address and then when we come to Alexander Campbell, we're going to raise the question just how far is he willing to go when it comes to restoration and unity. And so before we jump into this overview, uh, let's go ahead and bow for a word of prayer. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, profoundly grateful, God, just to be your people. We're thankful for your Son, who, according to your plan, came into this world, lived among us, showed us your way went to a cross to buy our way out of our sin and our slavery, then rose by the power of your Spirit to proclaim the good news that we can be free through Him. Thank you for sending your Spirit uh, to give us this salvation, to prompt us to spread the good news, to empower us to do the good work you've left us here to do, work that continues what Jesus did while He was here. God, we are so grateful that you have not left us as orphans, but God, you are present to and for and with us so that we can be present to, for, and with the world that you've called us to bless and serve. Thank you so much for the privilege of getting to be a part of what you're doing. And thank you for participating with us even as we participate in your work. God, we're grateful for all the things that have been voiced as we've asked what are we most grateful for in the past three weeks. God, we're so thankful that you don't give up on things when they break, that you don't abandon them when they go astray, but Father, you provide an influence to hopefully bring them back aright and to renew them and to restore them. Father, I pray that we will continually be about that work, asking questions, preserving the gospel of Christ, seeking to do things Bible ways, just as you've always called us to do. Help us to be faithful to your mission for our day, but to always do it in a way that remains true to your original intent, intent uh, for establishing your church. Bless our study, God, and I pray that as we discuss and learn, we would do so in a way and a spirit that honors you. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Okay, so tonight, as I said, I want to start out by just walking us through a little bit of the, of the chapter as, as we read it. If you'll look right here on the screen, this is a picture of Thomas Campbell. Thomas Campbell is the father of Alexander Campbell, who we often talk about more than, than Thomas. Uh, but Thomas is really the seed that, um, that grows into at least this part of our movement. You may not have known this, but Thomas Campbell was actually from Ireland. And I found it interesting as we read that he has a really interesting religious heritage. Turns out he comes from a long line of people who were just seeking truth. And so Thomas Campbell's father grew up Catholic. And at some point he converts uh, from Roman Catholicism to Anglicanism. But Thomas comes to a point where he's questioning that. and He eventually finds himself in the Scottish Presbyterian Church. And so he ends up in the Scottish Presbyterian Church in Ireland. 
And I just want to read this paragraph from our book, Renewing God's People. It says, While in Ireland, Thomas Campbell became dissatisfied with the narrowness of the old light, anti-burger, seceder Presbyterian church to which he belonged. Old light, anti-burger, seceder Presbyterian church. Each of these terms denoted a previous doctrinal split amongst Presbyterians. Campbell longed instead for the unity that the early church enjoyed and even made several unsuccessful attempts to unite the various factions in the seceder church in Ireland. And I'm reading from page 41 in the book. And so what I hope you see is that the way that God was working in Thomas Campbell's life, God is birthing in him a desire for unity, and he does that by placing him in a context where there's constant religious division. Despite his attempts to unify the churches, the Presbyterian churches in Ireland, that doesn't happen. And so when he gets the chance, in 1807 he immigrates to America and he ends up in rural western Pennsylvania. Rural western Pennsylvania, where he's preaching still in the the Presbyterian church at this point. While he is preaching in these churches, he gets censored. It's kind of like the the leadership of the Presbyterian church gives him a real smack on the hand, if you will, because he's not strict enough about the people to whom he administers communion. They say you need to be stricter, more rigorous in who you let come to the table of the Lord, and they censure Thomas Campbell. So in response to this, he starts a group of uh, an interdenominational Bible study group in Washington, And this interdenominational Bible study group is formed because he wants to just practice the simple gospel, the simple truths as he reads them in the New Testament. And so the the Washington Christian Association of Washington is born in 1807, I believe that is. In 1809, that association comes to him and says, you know, we're practicing this unity stuff. We're practicing things just exactly as we can according to Scripture. Just as exactly as we can according to Scripture. And they say, we would really like for you to write something that summarizes who we are as a movement. Something that identifies our purpose as a Bible study group. And thus, we get the declaration and address. Now, we'll dig into this more in just a minute. But for now, I just want you to know that this address is one of the founding documents of our movement. Okay, One of the founding documents of our movement. The reason I say that is this uh, document is to our movement what the Declaration of Independence is to the United States of America. It's this document that spells out the principles that will become our church DNA, so to speak. The Declaration of Address, and Address, if you're reading in the book, there are five major ways you can summarize it, five themes that come out of it. It's a fervent call to Christian unity, the writers say. It's a strong condemnation of division among Christians. It's a document that says doctrinal differences not based on the express teachings of the New Testament are the causes of division. Number four, a simple confession of faith in Jesus. Not agreement with an elaborate creed is all that is necessary for admission to the church. Number five, a desire to return to the purity of the first century church. And there's actually a sixth that I omitted. An appeal for love and understanding among Christians. This is in a nutshell the declaration and address. Now he drafts this in 1809. And around this same time, there's a lot of good stuff happening in the life of his son, Alexander Campbell. Now, this is Campbell when he's an older man, a really famous picture of him. Uh, but in Campbell's life, Campbell the younger, he is called by his father in 1808 to join Thomas Campbell in Pennsylvania in the United States of America. And his ship sets out from Ireland as it's coming around the coast of Scotland. He encounters, the ship almost sinks. They're shipwrecked in Scotland. And fortunately, he and all of his family survive this. But they end up uh, stranded in Glasgow in Scotland for a little over a year. This is one of these examples of how something that seems so bad in the moment, God can often use it to, to do some incredible work with. 
So during this time that he's stranded in Scotland, he goes to the University of Glasgow. And while there, he encounters a guy named Greville Ewing. And there are a lot of the practices that we do today that Campbell first encounters from Greville Ewing. For example, the plurality of elders in a church, weekly communion in a church, the autonomy of a church. He learns all of these things from Greville Ewing in the year that he shipwrecked in Scotland. And while he's in Scotland, God is gradually working this discontent, this dissatisfaction with the Presbyterian Church in Alexander Campbell at the very same time that it's happening with his father on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. And so when Alexander Campbell gets to America in 1809, he's united with his father later in the year, later in 1809, and his father wants him to read the first edition of the Declaration and Address before it's published. And it so touches Alexander Campbell at this point that he devotes himself to the practice of these principles for the rest of his life. He'll do whatever he can with the rest of his life to promote the principles of the Declaration and Address. And again, that's why I'm saying in a lot of ways that Declaration and Address is like the Declaration of Independence. Meanwhile, as his father and and he practiced this, the Washington Christian Association organizes to become the Brush Run Church. And that church is generally dated to 1811. That church continues to do good work, but there's a, there's a little bit of a, of a paradox in this. A movement that is promoting Christian unity is now suddenly starting its own church. Is that not just adding to all the division in the church scene at the time? And so, with these kinds of questions and tensions in mind, the Brush Run Church joins the Baptist Association, known as Redstone Baptist Association, in 1815. And then when things go south with that Baptist Association, they join another one in 1823 called the Mahoning Baptist Association. And it's during this time in our history, 1823 to 1830 especially, that the thought and the mindset that gives birth to the churches of Christ is being formulated in the mind and the writings of Alexander Campbell. And so again, it's, it's one of these things where something that we look at and we say, I don't know about that, God's actually deeply at work in it. It's interesting. In 1830, that Mahoning Baptist Association disintegrates, dissolves for good. And this is the date when most historians would say that the disciples of Christ are formed. And as you know, or maybe you don't, There are three modern-day movements, at least three, but primarily three, that attribute roots to the Restoration Movement. Who are are these three churches? Number one would be this one, the Churches of Christ. Number two would be the Disciples of Christ, this group. And number three would be the Christian Church, Independent Christian Church. Um, Yes, the Disciples of Christ, Christian Churches. And so all three movements attribute origin partly to Campbell, but the denomination that goes now by the name Disciples of Christ, they've got the red chalice with the cross. You know, there's one on central. This is when they claim their, their, or, uh, their beginning. And so now this is just a quick overview of the chapter. And before I keep going, I just want to give you a chance to ask any questions as you've read the chapter or ask any questions as you've heard me walk you through it. I'll open it up to you. Marcy. Well, I think it's really interesting what you were talking about, the father and son. And mm-hmm. this happened with the man with Barton Stone. Barton Stone? This, when they met, they had, they had met before, but they too had similar thoughts mm-hmm. in the scripture. Um, yeah. I think that, that's so interesting. Um, can you, I, I got it by the book. I'll buy it for the church tonight and share it with you. <laughs> I don't have probably as much as I'm gathering you would like. Uh, But from what I've read about that meeting in the past, they both, if I have read it right, and I'm not saying I have, but I've gotten the impression that when they meet, they're kind of walking on eggshells with each other. Because they're both 
and the Presbyterian Church. They're both, both ordained in the Presbyterian Church. And gradually it dawns on them that they're both discontented. And that's when Campbell Sr. says, hey, I'd like you to read the Declaration and Address. And, and Campbell Jr. realizes, oh, wow, God's been doing the same thing with you as with me. Now regarding stone, there are actually at least four different streams that will converge into what becomes the Restoration Movement. Stone's movement is one of those in the Ohio Valley, Bourbon County, Kentucky, that area. Campbell's is another, primarily in, in Virginia and West Virginia, Bethany, you know, that area, but still kind of in that near the Ohio Valley region. And then the, the other one would be James O'Kelly. He's got a, a movement in the South that's associated with the Methodists, uh, so the Carolinas especially. Uh, this is James O'Kelly's movement. And the last one is Abner Jones and Elias Smith up in New England, and that is typically associated with the Baptist churches. Uh, the Baptist churches. And so all four streams of these people are saying essentially the same thing. Let's go back to the Bible. Let's be united so that we can evangelize the world, get the gospel to the nations. And so all of these movements are going on simultaneously and eventually converge. Yes? Are those names mentioned in the book? Yep. Okay. Well, I, I want to write them down, but I can't do so. Got it. Okay. Good questions. And Marcy was just asking about you know, Stone and Campbell, basically, wasn't, weren't they doing the same things independently? And the answer is basically yes. And th those four groups were. Good question. Any other questions, comments before we keep trekking on? Bob? Well, I was just going to say, a lot of you know my history is conservative Christian church history. Mm -hmm. And uh, that basically group, they, they remained a part of the disciples until about 1950. Right. And what basically happened at that time they, the, well, they had a, they had a, a nationwide leadership for one thing, mm -hmm. and they were so they had a big bureaucracy, and that bureaucracy had become very liberal, and there was just it was kind of like what was going on here. They just couldn't put up with it anymore, mm -hmm. and it was a pretty massive movement that that happened, and and I think the official term, and I know that's what their book said was they were actually called the conservative Christian churches and churches of Christ. Right. Because I was actually baptized in a certain Christian church, but it was called the Shadrach Church of Christ. <laughs> right. Yeah, most of the time when I see it written, it's Christian church slash, sometimes in parentheses, churches of Christ. Or sometimes they're known as the instrumental churches of Christ. Uh, but yeah, very similar. Very similar. But it gets pretty, it gets pretty confusing yeah. if you're in certain parts of the country. It does. Very much so. Okay. These are good questions, comments. Marcy. Just comment. I'm thrilled that we're doing this. Well, good. I just, I just love it. Good. Okay, so what I want to do now, now that we've done kind of a brief overview of the movement, I want to zoom in a little bit. This is special focus number one. If we don't get to the second one, that's okay with me. That's fine. So if there's something in here that strikes your fancy, just know I'm okay with slowing down and just focusing on this. Because what this book will do, this book is not going to give you the historical detail that you're going to want. But what it will do is it will give you enough that you'll get a sense of this is where we come from, this is who we are. And so I want to zoom in on the declaration of an address because I think it especially gives us a sense of where we came from. So the Declaration of an Address, just as a reminder, it grows out of the Christian Association of Washington, Pennsylvania. And the reason it grows out of that group is this group is formed as an interdenominational Bible study. And the idea of the group is we just want to study the simple gospel so that we can be one. And so it has a real strong unity emphasis. And they come to Campbell and they ask him to draw up a document that states the purpose really who they are as an organization. And so, the way that one writer describes this, time out, let me do a, a real quick commercial break. This is the Encyclopedia of the Stone Campbell Movement. If you don't have one of these, you are more than welcome to borrow one of mine, because I think I actually have two. Um, but anyway, this book is not extremely cheap, but it is worth every penny. And the reason I say that is if you have a question about Stone, for instance, you can go in here and read this, and it'll give you probably a 15-page article about Stone, his bio. Same with Campbell. 
You know, if you have a question about, well, when were instruments introduced into the churches of Christ? Well, this will give you a, a really good summary of L.L. L. Pinkerton and the Melodian in Midway, Kentucky in 1851, I think it was. But anyway, this will give you a lot of that historical detail you probably want. So as we go through this, I'm going to use this book constantly. I'm using it here. So when you see encyclopedia and a page number, this is what you're getting. But the writer of the article on the Declaration and Address says, this is how he summarizes it, he says it was an urgent summons to Christian unity. And so I want to emphasize that. It was an urgent summons to Christian unity. And so if you were to trace the history of Churches of Christ back, what were we about from the very beginning? Unity. Unity. I find that somewhat ironic. I really do. Somewhat ironic. But we were a unity movement in the very beginning. The question remains, though, why were we a unity movement? For unity's sake? No. It wasn't about unity for unity's sake. If you have your Bible and you want to go to John 17, let me just share with you the reason that drove our movement to unite or to pursue unity. This is John 17. It's the very last part of uh, the last night of Jesus' life, that farewell discourse it's often called. And the last part of that farewell discourse where Jesus is saying goodbye is a prayer that he prays not only over his apostles, but also for those who will hear the gospel through the teaching of the apostles. And if you just go down through the years, that's you and me as well. Jesus says in John 17 verse 20, he says, I do not ask for these only. In other words, just his apostles. I'm praying broader than just these, God but also for those who will believe in me through their word, through their message, that they may be all, all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. What's the implication of disunity? according to Jesus' prayer. Evangelism, Evangelism what? It's all, people being saved. it's all about people being saved, but disunity. Does disunity help people be saved or hurt people being saved? I'm sorry. Yes. You're, did you? Well, y'all, I've been in the South for two weeks. It's coming out of me. Well, good. I thank you for that. It hurts unity. When you can live in a 1,200-person town, which I did growing up, and you can find at least 10 churches within a one-mile radius, it hurts the cause of Christ. And when they fuss and fight and squabble over minutia, which the world doesn't understand that that may not be as minute as they think, but when they fuss and squabble and fight over minutia, if we can't get along, they get enough fighting in the workplace, in school, at home, last place they want to fight is church. So it hurts the mission of the church when we're not one. Bob, I think. I, I grew up, uh, the congregation I grew up in had weekly Bible, you know, it, it, various nights in their home. Mm-hmm. It was a lot of, a lot of a small group Bible studies. And, and I grew up not, I, I didn't like those studies. Hmm. Now, oftentimes they would end up, you know, with two very smart people having a, a discussion about something. Know, about this or that or the other thing that really is, I found very, very confusing to unbelievers. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I would say that it's no different than what First Corinthians 14 talks about, that when they had speaking in tongues and those kind of things, there were very strict guidelines in regards to the use of certain spiritual gifts. Mm-hmm. And the, one of the primary purposes of was is so that they did not confuse the unbelievers. Right. And, and that's the thing that, you know, you can be awful smart, but you can confuse, you know, people. And because, I mean, if people are, if I think we've become a tremendous stumbling And I think these early leaders would say that too, because remember, and I'm assuming Lucas and Scott Lucas covered this last week, that's exactly what they saw. Religions were just flourishing in the, the early days of the United States, but the Christian cause was arguably going backwards because of the disunity. Same thing that Bob is talking about. We have to be careful about how we teach 
lest we confuse outsiders and compromise the advance of the gospel. So this idea for evangelistic uh, mission, getting the gospel into the world, that is the why that drives the unity. Okay? There's actually another why beneath this, which I'll just mention, and you can write this down and do more digging on this if you want, but the why behind getting the mission into the world, do you just want to take a guess what that is? Why does it matter so much that we get the gospel into all the world? That's Christ's last word, so that's part of it, but there's actually something else that drives these people. It's the return of Christ. Because what did Jesus say? That this gospel must be first preached in all nations. And I'm going to paraphrase at this point. But what he's saying is, I want everybody to hear this so that no one can point to God and say, you never told me so. Huh? Okay, so you can go to Matthew 24 and find a reference to the verses where Jesus talks about the gospel going into all the world. And I believe it's also in Mark 13. So they, de- they deeply want to see the return of Christ. And the way that they believe they can get there is by getting the gospel into all the world. And the way that they can get the gospel into all the world is all these Christians stop fighting each other and start fighting the real enemy, so to speak. And so the why that, that motivates this unity is the mission of the church, the return of Christ. And the how, this is important... How can we be one? This is what I'm going to simply call restoration principles. You say, well, what are those restoration principles? The guys that wrote the article on the Declaration and Address in the big encyclopedia, what they tell you, and I've actually I've read the Declaration and Address. It's been about eight years ago. It's very difficult. It's about 50, 55 pages. It's uh, dense. It's hard to read. Uh, but if you ever want to read through it, I encourage you to do that. You can find it online. But these editors of this dictionary, this encyclopedia, have summed it up for you in five principles. And let me give these to you. Principle number one, the church of Christ on earth is essentially, intentionally, and constitutionally one. In which case, schism is a horrid evil, destructive of the visible body of Christ. Local congregations, which Thomas Campbell will call societies... Local congregations or societies of Christians are the expression of this one universal church and, as such, should not be divided from one another but exercise the same mind. Somebody summarize that for me in one sentence. Keep the unity. Keep the unity. Why why should we be one? Because what this says is that in our very nature, we are one. And so this is what Ephesians 4, 3 talks about. We preserve, we maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We don't create unity. Unity is already there. We just have to maintain it or preserve it. Principle number two. Up only the authority of Jesus Christ and His apostles as enjoined upon the New Testament church, either in express terms or by approved precedent is binding, not biting, is binding upon Christians and sets the terms of communion in the church. Time out. The only authority for who's in and who's out is what the Bible explicitly commands or the examples that the scripture explicitly approves. Divine command and approved example. Those are the terms of communion and they're found in the New Testament church. They come through Jesus and through the apostles. That's a dense statement, okay? But again, that's what he's saying. That authority is conveyed through the New Testament. In other words, where do we find these approved examples and these divine commands? Primarily in the New Testament. That authority is conveyed through the New Testament, which, though inseparably connected with the Old Testament, is the sole constitution of the church. Thus, No human authority can presume to supplement the silence of Scripture or impose new commands or ordinances so as to redefine the terms of communion in the church. The summary, the bullet point for that is, this is what I would say. This book and this alone, primarily the New Testament, determines who's in and who's out. Do we agree with that? Amen. Amen. (laughs) What more can we say? Go ahead, Scott. No disagreement 
Nope, you're good. And then you're right. He does summarize it well in those phrases. Where the Bible is silent or unclear, we should not divide. When the Bible is silent or unclear, what do we do instead of divide? No, it's not be silent. There's something else. Not study. We love one another. We forbear with one another. We tolerate one another. We make allowances for one another. Yeah, we do keep silent where Scripture says. I'm not saying we don't. But the actual practice that helps us be one, even when what Scripture says is unclear, is forbearing with one another. The, the fruit of the Spirit, in other words. Okay, principle number three, declaration and address. Theological inferences from Scripture, when fairly inferred, may be considered biblical doctrine, but are not binding on Christians' consciences farther than their ability to comprehend them and cannot become terms of communion. Do we understand what we mean by, by theological inferences? A theological inference would be something like this. Scripture does not explicitly tell me this. But if I, on the basis of this Scripture, tied to this Scripture, I can come to a conclusion that God is either okay with this or He's not okay with this. For example, Scripture does not tell me that if I go 56 and a 55, I'm violating the law of God. But some people, and I'm not saying I do, if you've ever read with me, you know better, but some people would reasonably conclude that the idea of obeying the laws of the land and keeping a good conscience prohibit anyone from going 56 and a 55. What Thomas Campbell is saying is you may well get there. You may could make a compelling case for that view. But you can't bind that on other people because they might not follow the inference trail the same way that you do. Most recently, and I hope I'm not stepping into this, but I'm going to go there, our positions on masks. Our position on masks, you know what? I think you can make a deeply compelling case for why every believer needs to have a mask. I think you could make a deeply compelling case for why every believer needs to get a vaccine. But I think you can also make a deeply compelling case for why no believer should wear a mask and for why no believer can get a vaccine. Do you see what I'm saying? You can stream the Scriptures together and come to either conclusion. And Thomas Campbell is saying that when we can come to different conclusions following the inferences, we can't bind our convictions on other people. Inferences cannot be the basis of our unity, in other words. Theology, in other words, has a relative teaching, that's what catechetical means, a relative teaching value, but cannot define the basis of Christian fellowship. In other words, what holds us together is not our agreement on every single opinion. There's something bigger than that that pulls us together. Principle number four, only a consciousness of sin Profession of faith in Jesus Christ and manifest obedience to Him are the terms for admission into the church. Now here's the background of that. And the American frontier, the primary force that was propelling the gospel westward was Calvinism. And a conviction about Calvinism at the time was that there was a certain experience you had to have which demonstrated that you were one of the chosen of God. Barton Stone could not have that experience. Alexander Campbell, so far as I'm aware, never had that experience. And there were lots of people on the frontiers who were saying, I can't have that experience at the mourner's bench that so many of y'all are having. What Campbell says instead is only a consciousness of sin, a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, and a manifest obedience to Him are the terms for admission into the church. Since division in the church has always been and is now spurred by Christians imposing human inventions, it is incumbent on all to respect the divinely authorized terms of communion. Consciousness of sin, faith in Jesus Christ, manifest obedience to Him. That's the admission. Principle number five, matters of expedience. Expedience means this is the way we do things. 
in this time, in this place. This is how we choose to get it done. Whereas in other times and other places, people may choose to get it done differently. Right? Matters of expedience. And the execution of the divine ordinances must be identified as such and acted on without becoming objects of contention. You know, right behind me, there is an empty tray. Doggone it. Well, anyway, you can use your imagination and imagine that there were cups in this. Did you know that there was a time when Christians were fussing and fighting over whether we could have individual communion cups? They still do. You're exactly right. One cuppers. Well, my family were liberal, you see. They had two cups, one for each side. And that was, that was liberal. But there were churches, and my uncle could tell you exactly where they were in East Tennessee, that split when, I believe it was G.C. Brewer, suggested they use individual cups. Made a lot of sense. It was expedient. But you wouldn't believe how many churches split over the issue of individual communion cups. It was expedient then. It helped them do the Lord's Supper in an in a easier way. I'm thankful we have individual cups because during COVID, I don't know what we would do if we were sitting on the back row. I just don't. I don't. It's a matter of expedience. And Campbell says, what's that? Yeah, but see, then we'd be fussing and fighting. and that be a long front row. That's exactly right. But you know what? That might, it might be time to bring back the one cup because I think you're right. Yeah. Matters of expedience must be identified as such and acted upon without becoming objects of contention. We got to know what is necessary and we got to know what's not necessary. And where things are not necessary, we got to give people grace. Now, these are the principles upon which Thomas Campbell's declaration and address is are based is is yeah is based right he breaks it down into 13 ideas these guys have condensed them down into five but what i want you to see in this is that throughout this thomas campbell's driving aim is unity another driving aim that you might say is there is is restoration meaning we're going to go back to the original if you want to use the word pattern, I'll close my eyes and my ears while you do it. But the original pattern, restoration and unity, Thomas Campbell holds them together. Now just an observation on this. When you hold restoration and unity together, those two are in tension. They're in tension because if you intentionally say we're going to do things the way the Bible says that's going to pull you away from unity because not everybody's going to see it that way. And if you intentionally pursue unity, that's going to pull you away from doing things exactly like the Bible says. But what defines the church of Christ in those early days is that they're holding on to both of those. And that productive tension between the two of those, that productive tension between the two of those is the dynamic that fuels the fire of our early leaders. I think what happens in the 1900s, as Bob was referring to earlier, there is a group of our movement that lift up unity, and they elevate unity over restoration. And that leads to the trek that became the disciples of Christ. And the churches of Christ were saying, no, 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 we can't do those instruments because we don't find them in the New Testament. This other group's prizing unity. Everybody else is doing it. Unity. Churches of Christ are saying, no, 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 no. we got to go back to the Bible ways and do Bible things in Bible ways. That pulls them apart and makes them different from everybody who prizes unity. Church, what we got to do is we got to hold those two together because that was what held our early movement together. Not lifting restoration up over unity or unity up over restoration, but holding them together. Pursuing restoration as a means to unity so that the gospel can get in the world, so that Christ can return and the kingdom can come in its fullness. Well, we are at time, unfortunately, but this is where we are. As you go out, I'd encourage you to think about this question. I'd love to discuss it, but as I said, we're just out of time. 
But how do these same concepts shape what we do and or what we don't do? I think if you think about these five principles, it'll illuminate quite a bit for you as to who we are and why we do things here the way we do things. Thank you, and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful night. See you Sunday.